Hello everyone, and welcome to what I believe is the very last video of this semester. There may be a couple, one or two more, but we'll see. Um, but I think this is the last one on necessarily new content for subject that could be actually on the exam. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is distillation, setting up a distillation column in Aspen, and how to do a design spec, or how do you make Aspen give you an answer that you're looking for and you're designing the specific, like look for a specific design uh, parameter. So, with that said, uh, let me first explain what distillation is. I'm sure you already know a lot of this, but we it's helpful to kind of refresh ourselves and think about it in terms of what we're talking about when we say distillation column. Now, distillation is uh, nothing more than equilibrium separation. What we mean is that we're using vapor-liquid equilibrium to separate, two, to separate components, uh, most commonly two components or however you're thinking of. And all the examples we've done so far in class has been based on the idea of a flash drum, where you take in a single feed of, comp of some mixture, let's say if it's a binary mixture, and you put uh, it it's at a high temperature, high pressure, it comes into the dr uh, drum, and then it flashes, meaning that we have a liquid coming out of the bottom and a vapor coming out of the top. That can only happen as long as you're within the bubble point and dew point of the mixture. And so as long as you're at that conditions, you're going to have vapor in one side that's going to be enriched in one of the components and a liquid that's going to be enriched in another. Now, the best you can hope for in this case is going to be based upon thermodynamics. Whatever the composition is at equilibrium in the vapor phase and liquid phase, that's, it is what you get. There, there's no improving that. However, if you think about it, uh, in the liquid we have things, let's say it's ethanol and water. And we're feeding, flashing it in at a single uh, temperature, at a single conditions, and you're going to have an ethanol at the top. It's going to be higher concentration of ethanol at the top than water because it's got a higher vapor pressure. Uh, and at the bottoms, you're going to have more liquid, more water than you do ethanol. But you'll still have ethanol here. So how can we get that ethanol back uh, out? What if we want to separate that? Well, we can actually add another flash to this part. And similarly in the vapor, we have water up there. What if we don't want that water? We just want pure ethanol. Well, we can put another flash there. Now, in this case, we can reconnect this output to the flash drum. We can connect this one to here, and we have uh, uh, an, a new output. Uh, here, we can actually then reconnect this here. We can reconnect that there, and then we can connect this here and this here. So now we have, oops, let's delete that. Ah, no, escape, escape. Delete, yes, delete stream seven. Let's put this here. And so, okay. So now you're seeing we kind of have a mess here. We have four streams coming out. We have a vapor phase, a liquid phase, a vapor phase, a liquid phase. Now, these vapor phases, uh, this is going to be enriched in ethanol. This is going to be even more enriched in water, which is what we want. But this intermediate one is still a waste, right? But what if we took it and fed it back to this intermediate flash drum? Well, what's going to happen there is now this flash drum, this mixture of ethanol and water, is going to uh, go back in here, get reflashed, and you're going to have your enriched ethanol coming at the top, enriched water coming at the bottom, and this enriched water further is going to come at the bottom. And similarly, we can take this phase and cycle that back. And so this gets a little messy to look at, but um, just bear with me here. And so now. If you look at it this way, we now have this uh, liquid intermediate liquid phase coming down back to this flash drum. We have this intermediate vapor phase coming back up to this flash drum to get reflashed and send these out here. And now at the top we have this enriched ethanol stream, which is a higher pro percentage ethanol than we did from the single one because we went to another uh, flash drum. And here we have an enriched water phase that's even better than that single step was because we took. Uh, this new composition and put it down here. Now you can envision, well, what's to stop us from doing this another time? And we can expand even further, or fourth or fifth, and so forth. And do they actually need to be separate containers even in this case? Because we are just looking at vapor liquid equilibrium. What if they weren't containers? What if they were just uh, plates, so to speak, or, or, or areas of water? And that is, in a nutshell, exactly what uh, continuous or stage distillation is. If you look at an actual distillation column, which is uh, I'll give you an example of continuous distillation, that's exactly what you have. You have a system where you're taking a feed into uh, a, um, into a column, and you'll have a plate 
that exists at a certain temperature. And at this temperature, you have a composition of liquid that kind of sits on this plate, and uh, you have a vapor stream that's going to be bubbling up. Now, as this vapor comes bubbling up through this liquid, it's going to become into equilibrium. So the ethanol is going to get rich in the top, or the light component is going to get rich in the top, and the heavier component, in this example of ethanol water, is going to get rich in the liquid. And then as this liquid accumulates in this, strage, uh, in this plate, there'll be a little lip here, and so you can kind of think of it like a, a, a beaker of water, and if you start pulling up too much water, that lip water starts to overflow. And so the water will come down here, or the liquid will come down here into this next stage. And this state, this liquid is now has a higher composite, uh, is going to come down to this lower temperature, or higher temperature, I should say, I'm sorry, because it's going to the bottom, higher temperature liquid, and uh, the vapor is coming up again, and it's now going to be at a different equilibrium. And so each stage represents just another equilibrium stage of liquid vapor equilibrium. And as we go up this column, the temperature decreases, which means more and more of the heavier component is coming out of the vapor because it doesn't have enough energy uh, in it to remain volatile. So it's going to come into liquid, and more of the uh, lighter key is going to stay vaporized up until it comes out of the top to which it gets the condenser. And then this condenser, we can actually take this amount, liquid, and either send it all out or take a certain fraction of it and put it back into the column uh, to recycle it down. We call this the reflux. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire, you'll have a long time next semester, an entire semester, uh, where you're going to spend a lot of time learning how this works and learning a lot about how we can use uh, very simple um, <clears throat> uh, uh, calculations to measure and predict and design a distillation column for specific separations. Uh, but for this class, and for the purposes here, I just want to show you how we can actually use Aspen to calculate this for us. Now, importantly, if we're talking about equilibrium stages, and that's what we're using is equilibrium stage separation, we have to be mindful of what it is what we're talking about when we say stages. Um, and so each stage is a place where we're at a vapor and liquid equilibrium. So in intermediate, in each one of these stages, we have uh, a, uh, an equilibrium, so this represents a different stage. At the bottom, I didn't mention it yet, but we have what we call a reboiler. All that liquid's coming down, we're heating it back up and sending the vapor phase all the way back up. So this reboiler is actually the source of all the heat within this column. And uh, this reboiler, because it's actually a boiling pot of liquid, is an equilibrium stage. It's, it's a place where we have vapor-liquid equilibrium. So that is a stage, this is a stage, and each one of these is a stage. The only part that may or may not be a stage is the condenser. If the condenser is what we call a partial condenser, meaning that only in this, as it condenses liquid, only a part of the li uh, liquid is being condensed and that liquid part is being refluxed back, that would be considered uh, um, an equilibrium stage, an impartial condenser. But if it's a total condenser, meaning we're taking all that vapor coming out of the top of the column, turning it into a liquid, and then splitting that liquid back and then the other liquid out, that's not a stage because it's, there's no separation, there's no vapor phase. So uh, most of the time we're talking about, in this case here, it's a true part a total condenser because we, we normally don't have partial condensers on the top but uh, that, that can happen so with all that said this is um, the general format that we can do uh, for an equilibrium system now obviously the variables that affect distillation are going to be things like the number of trays as we increase the number of trays as you'd expect uh, the uh, separation improves. You can improve the number of uh, separation the higher the purity on the top output. Uh, as we uh, we can change the heat of the reboiler, we can look at the reflux ratio and how much we add back in. Uh, we can look at full uh, boil, flow rates, feed rates, all of these things. Feed location even in this column can change design. So you can imagine there are a lot of things we can affect. That's going to affect uh, distillation. A lot of knobs we can turn. Um, and all this is, and the goal here is to get high, uh, best product purity while remaining energy efficient. Certainly you can spend a ton of money and energy to get the best separation, but we want to do this efficiently. So these are the really goals that we're going to be optimizing in the long run. And this is where Aspen can help us on this case. Because there's a lot you can imagine that we can do. So I'm going to give you an example to, uh, in this video of how we can do this and, and, and what we can do. And we're going to go through a classic example here of looking at the separation of methylcyclohexane and toluene. So now, 
Uh, the nice thing about the separation is, and we're, we're going to describe it here, uh, we actually have a column that's already been designed for us. We're just going to characterize it, uh, and we'll explain uh, mainly because it's an easier for, uh, point for us to start with. And so let me bring this up. There we go. Now, uh, this is going to be the system that we're designing off of, and you'll notice uh, this time around we're going to be working in English units just for the sake of changing things up a little bit. So let's go ahead and go over to Aspen and start setting this up so you can see how this is going to look. So I'm going to create a new system, new, general with English units. So this time we're doing English units. I'm going to save the current run before opening. Nope, I don't want to do that. Uh, okay, Aspen, you can yell at me. And do 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 do. It's opening up on my other screen. It's waiting as it goes. Wait, here it comes. All right. No, let's just close this. Save changes. No. Okay. There you go. So here we have the new system. So let's go ahead and set up the components. So the first component we're going to look at is methylcyclohexane and toluene. That's what we're going to be trying to. Uh, uh, Let's see, methyl cyclohexane. Yes, close. I think I said toluene, right? Methyl cyclohexane and toluene. Yes, that is what we are separating. And find toluene. Great, close. Now, these are the two components we're going to have. I'm going to call this MCH. Uh, rename, and I'll call this toluene, rename, there you go. Okay, so that's a little bit easier to follow when we know what we're doing. So, and we're going to do this selective method. Um, I can tell you right now, these are going to be a rather non-ideal system. Uh, a good one to run for non-ideal systems is Unifac. So we'll just select Unifac. Unifac, where are you? Right there. So Unifac, select that one, and we are all set. Good. So now let me show you what we're going to be playing with here and we're dealing with uh, the system. Um, binary. We'll do a TXY diagram. Uh, the system was around 20 PSI that we're running, so we'll just select 20 PSI as our system. We're going to do a TXY diagram, run analysis, and this is what we're seeing. So methylcyclohexane is our component. Uh, you'll notice that it's the light key component we say is one that's going to be enriched in the vapor phase. We know that because at every composition, you can think about this bottom feed as what's going to be in equilibrium with the, uh, uh, this bottom feed here. If we're within this range, these tie lines between these two points represent uh, the equilibrium concentration at a single temperature. So in other words, if we're at a temperature of 243 and we are feeding in a composition of say 25%, the actual concentration of liquid phase leaving that system would be 20, about 22% and somewhere around 30%. Now you'll notice, and then if you took this 30% vapor phase and sent it to the next stage down, at whatever that is, it'll be separating between these two new things. So that's actually the way this is going to work for a stage separation. But you'll notice here is you get pretty good separation in the compositions between where you're at 5% and probably up to around 70% uh, uh, methylcyclohexane. However, if you're trying to enrich this to above 90% or so forth, you'll notice you'll have a heck of a time doing this. We have an azeotrope here, meaning that as we get higher and higher compositions, the actual com uh, difference in composition of the vapor phase and liquid phase become uh, equal to each other, meaning you can no longer separate this. What that really means is we need to come up with some way to break what we call the azeotrope, the system that's at this equal composition in the vapor and liquid phase. And there are ways we can do that. We can do try to try different pressures. We can try to do uh, absorption systems. Um, but a very common way of doing this is adding a third component that can act as a, an absorbent. And that is exactly what we're going to be doing. We're going to be using phenol as an extractant to help improve separation and break this azeotrope in this system. So this is a really good example of how we can uh, run the system and, and look at uh, the separation from this. So let's start the simulation. So we're going to go over the simulation. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a column. And the column specifies um, 
the separation columns that we're going to be talking about. Now there's a lot of them here that you can see. The ones that are probably the most relevant to you that you'll be working with next semester uh, in the fall are the, um, this DSTW uh, one and the RADFRAC. The DSTW, you can see if you hover over here, is a Winwood underwood gillian method. It actually lets you do some very short, simple ways of trying to size a column to get initial specs on this. You'll learn a lot more about this uh, next semester, uh, but it's a kind of a, um, a quick and dirty way of setting up initial how big a column should be, what would it be, in a, um, um, what's the minimal number of stages in, in these information, um, and what's the total reflex, or not total reflex, what's minimal reflex, what's the minimal number of stages, these kind of questions. Now, the one that we want to run today, though, is the RADFRAC. That is what we call the rigorous uh, calculations. You have to plug in everything. You can't uh, leave anything unknown and run it, but it'll give you a very uh, direct and uh, exacting information on the system that you, that you want. And so this is the one that you almost always will run uh, as you're designing things in the end. So we're going to call this the column because I am clever with names. Column. There you go. Now we can say again material stream and you'll notice here we can feed in a feed stream here. We'll have bottoms is required and now the tops are required. Now you'll notice the actual location here doesn't matter. It's uh, you have to have one either one here or one here. Now it'll, it'll tell you um, here that this is going to be a vapor distillate. This is going to be a liquid distillate. Um, I don't necessarily know in, in if this actually holds you to that. If you select the liquid, it, it has to be liquid. Or if you select this, it has to be that. This is just by convention the way the pictures usually look. So in this case, since we almost always do total condenser where we want the liquid distillate, we'll put it down here. That, again, is just uh, by convention. And we'll call this the distillate. We'll call it distill. And the other clever name that people have given the stuff that comes out of the bottom of the column is the bottoms. Wow. All right. So there we go. We have the streams named. We're all good there. And so now we can go ahead and start labeling Oh no, what does that mean? Oh, Aspen has stopped working. That's always fun. Close. Awesome. I'm going to leave that in because I think it's important to see that Aspen does silly things. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause the video and I'm going to bring us back up to a point where we were so you don't have to sit and watch me do this whole thing again. But I just want to leave that in because I think it's helpful to see. Yeah, Aspen does weird things every now and then. All right, so we are back to where we were. Um, I am now going to do something that I have been negligent to do, but that is save the file. Um, you get oftentimes comfortable without doing this. And you do that at your own peril. So I'm going to call this still an example. There you go. Okay. So now we have that. Now we saved it, so we're good. So let's go to our streams. We're going to talk about our feed stream, and I try to remember where our feed stream is. Uh, it's 200 power mole of toluene, 200 power mole of MCH. Um, okay, so the temperature is 220 Fahrenheit, 20 psi. Correct. Awesome. And and we are power moles, so 200 and 200. Excellent. So now that feed is completely satisfied. Go to our block, open this up in columns, and so now we can set up our configuration. Now you notice there's a lot of things we can set up and operating specifications. Um, these are the two variables that we're, uh, these are the, the thing that we're going to be uh, changing that are effectively the physical parameters of the column, um, meaning the size, shape, how many stages, and that kind of stuff that we have, how many physical plates are in there, and how many stages. Now you'll notice here. The number of equilibrium stages that we're going to define are going to be 22. And keep in mind, the number of stages doesn't equal the number of plates here. It's actually the number of plates here plus the reboiler. So it's going to be 21 uh, columns, 21 stages in the column, and, 20, and the 22 is the reboiler. So we're going to go here. And we're going to say the number of stages, equilibrium stages, are 22. Uh, we're going to say an equilibrium uh, separation, not a rate-based separation. 
and the condenser we're going to say is a total condenser and so that should be completely satisfied so now the other thing we're going to look at is we're going to specify the distillate rate of 200 pound moles per hour now we could do a, a degree of freedom analysis on the column um, but uh, if you were to do that you'll see that we have two degrees of freedom that we can specify on a column so we have to specify two things and that's what we're doing right now and most commonly we specify it reflux ratio because that's the easiest thing to specify and in this case we're also just uh, specifying a reflux rate um, a distillate rate and so here we're going to specify the reflux ratio of 8 and what that means is um, we have 8 times the liquid coming back to the column as what's coming out so effectively the reflux ratio means our distillate rate is 200 pound moles per hour we are sending in 1600 pound moles back into the column and as you can imagine, as we send more of this liquid back to the column, our separation will improve. We'll get better and better separation. But we're also making this column volume much, much bigger and much more costly. And so that's going to be satisfied there. Uh, we also have to specify where the stage is coming in at. And now we're going to specify the stream is coming in at stage 14. And that's all satisfied. And then finally, we just have to specify the pressure. Uh, we can look at the column here, and we see again that our condenser pressure is specified to be uh, 16 PSI. So we can enter that in, 16, and we are fully satisfied now. We're ready to go. So let's uh, click Save and see how this separation is going to go. Uh, hopefully we'll run. We'll click Run. Oh, and there's some things I forgot to do again. Um, let's go back to Setup open up the report options let's go to the flow sheet or stream options let's go to mole basis and uh, let's go to mole fraction basis let's get mass fractions as well that doesn't hurt to have um, we can also go to our properties uh, property sets and uh, let's get our transport properties this time around um, I think that'll be helpful uh, information for us to look at um, okay and so we can leave it at that. We can uh, we can add other things as well in the property sets if we want. We can look at uh, obtaining the vapor pressures of our liquid, our fugacity, and other information if we want VLE information. But we'll just leave it at that for now. So let's go ahead and let's save it again. Let's rerun it. And let's look at the results. So we can go results summary and run status, streams, and we can see how well the separation worked for us. Uh, if we look at the bottoms composition and the feed compositions, let's go down to our mole fraction because that will be the most informative analysis that we can look at here. And you'll see um, that sure enough, we did enrich things a lot well, uh, very well. The methyl cyclohexane is enriched in a distillate. We have eight, it's now an 82% mixture uh, in moles versus uh, toluene, uh, uh, which is 82% in the bottoms. So we've got a really nice separation in that regard. Uh, let's look at the C how well um, uh, how the stages looked on the system now the nice thing about Aspen when you do rad frac is it's going to give you a lot of detail on the outcomes on what things look like and you'll notice here we'll see the balance you can see the split fractions of how much uh, of 100% of the methyl cyclohexane coming in 82% is coming in the distillate 17% is coming in, in the bottoms which is uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. We can see the split fractions from there. But the most interesting thing I think from the columns you can gain is by looking at the profiles. And the profile is exactly that. It's going to tell you what things look like on the stage as you go through the column. You'll look at each stage coming from the top of the column on down to the bottom of the column. It's telling you the temperature, how the temperature changes throughout the column, what the pressure is as it changes throughout the column is saying everything at 16 is just saying there's no pressure drop which is fine um, and we can look at the liquids the vapor uh, uh, flow rates uh, throughout the column and um, uh, the mole fraction liquid enthalpy and so forth you can get all of these information but really interestingly though is the composition data on each uh, stage and what you'll notice here is we're getting good separation as we go up the stage, the stages are changing, but 
as we go up to the top, we are starting to see or hit a wall in separation. So we're maybe not getting as good of separation as we want. Uh, this is particularly uh, visible as we start looking at uh, the K values that we're seeing in these cases uh, with the partition of the Y and the X values, how different they are. So this is an important mix. So now the question is, can we rather uh, improve separation by looking at adding a third component, in this case, <clears throat> by adding phenol and seeing how that will improve or weaken our separation. So with that case in mind, let's go back to our initial properties. We'll have to add a new component now. And I'm going to save again because I'm afraid it's going to crash. But go to component specifications and let's add phenol. And phenol's there, so we'll just leave it at that. And now we can go back to our simulation and go to the main flow sheet. And now we can just add a new material stream. I'll bring it up here just so it looks like it's above it because we're going to add it at a stage higher than the feed stream. And we're going to call this phenol. Awesome. Now, let's go to specifications. Oh, that's common specifications. Let's go to phenol. And in this case here, we're getting 1,200 pound moles and 220 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 PSI. So it's going to be the same conditions, just um, 1,200 pound mole. Okay. So 220 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 PSI, and phenol is going to be 1,200 pound moles per hour, correct? Lovely. Awesome. And we are good. That's fully satisfied. We'll go to the blocks, specifications. You'll notice we have one other stream coming in, and that's phenol. And it, we didn't tell it where it's going to happen, so we have to. We'll tell it's coming at stage 7. And that's it. So now we're satisfied. I'm going to say save. Blank has one inlet in summary instead of... Uh, oh, okay, that's fine. Um, let's reset the loads. Okay, reset, initialize. Reinitialize, purging everything. That's not a bad thing to do. Let's save that. It's happy with that. Let's run. And now, let's go to stream summaries this time around. And what do you notice right away is our methyl ethyl uh, uh, hexane, uh, which apparently didn't rename it. That's weird. Um, here in the mass fraction, or we can go to our mole fraction, either way you want to look at it. You can see that we've greatly enhanced our uh, purity in the liquid phase or in the vapor phase of the methyl ethyl ketone. Um, in the, the toluene, now it bottoms. The composition is much lower. That's mainly because all the phenol that we're adding in at 1,200 pound mole of phenol is all coming out of the bottoms. There's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction that's coming out the distillate, but uh, it is all coming down. Um, uh, in the bottoms, and so that's why this composition is, is decreasing. We can look at, if we want, we can look at now the split fractions. If we want to know how yields are going, we can go to our column, go to the split fraction results, and sure enough, you're seeing that the methyl ketone is being heavily enriched in the distillate, uh, with toluene being predominantly coming out of the bottoms, um, and phenol being very, very much coming out of the bottoms. If we look at the profiles and the compositions, you can now see that we are achieving uh, much higher separations than we were in them before uh, uh, compared to the other systems. So I think this is a very uh, useful exercise to see how well we could use um, phenol to um, separate out and look at um, and improve the separation in this case. All right, one thing we can look at, one other thing we can look at, is uh, let's look at uh, the block column. Let's go to our results again. <clears throat> and some of the summary things we can look at is what the heat duties are of our system. So we can actually look at the reboiler heat duty, how much energy is being pumped into the system uh, to uh, have, and help the separation. And you can actually look at the heat duty of how much heat is being taken out at the top uh, to cool off. So how much heat are we losing to the system? Uh, because we had to chill the, the uh, system down. So we can see this, and we can actually look at um, 
how this behaves. Now, let's look at the question of, uh, let's do a sensitivity analysis and see just how well our separation will proceed as we vary uh, the um, the um, uh, phenol flow rate. So let's close this. Let's go down to model analysis tools. Sensitivity analysis. We'll do a new one. And click OK. Now we'll say very. In this case, we'll say new number, new variable. This time we're going to be varying a stream var, a stream variable, and the stream is going to be the phenol stream, and the variable we're going to set is the moles flow rate, moles per hour, and then we can say an overall range. Um, and let's say we're going to vary it from, I don't know, 0 to 2,000. Let's do it in increments of 100. That seems reasonable. Um, and let's do 2,500. I have no clue why that. Okay, there you go. So that's what we're going to vary. Uh, and that's fine. Now let's look at a couple different variables. Let's look at the X of the methylcyclohexane in the distillate. Okay, let's say XD. MCH, methylcyclohexane, X, the composition of the distillate of that. So this is going to be another stream bar. And we are going to be looking at mole fraction of the distillate. And the component of interest is the methylcyclohexane. Close. Let's also look at the duties. Let's look at the uh, reboiler duty. Reduty. And this is now going to be a block var. We can look at the block is the column. And this one this should have the list that we want. We can look at, go down to R, because I think it's reboiler. So many options. Reb duty. Calculated reboiler duty. That's what we want. And that seems good. So close. Let's also look at the condenser duty. Con duty. That's another block var. Block var. Column. The variable is who wants to think it's con duty? Uh, do, 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 do. Cool. Cond duty. There, calculate condenser duty. That's what we want. All good. Close. Great. So we can go to tabulate, fill variables. Look at all the variables here. Let's go to table format. Let's explain what these things are. The first one is um, MCH um, mol frac in distill. And we can say two is going to be three boil duty and the, I believe this was in BTUs per hour. Is that correct? And this was going to be a condenser duty. Also in BTU per hour. Close. And now let's look at. Yeah, yep, that's all good. So we can say go. And let us evaluate. We get results in the sensitivity analysis, and we have some very nice bits of information. And you can see really quickly. Um, well, let's just go to results curve. And see how this all be, plays out. Oh, I have to go over to my other screen, drag this over here so you can see it. I'm going to plot all three of those. Okay. And so you can see now. You can see the condenser duty, the reboiler duty, and the mole fraction behavior in the system. And one of the things you'll notice here is as we improve our separation, as we 
look at uh, uh, where is the oh this is really weird so that is our these values look like they got messed up interesting I should double check that um, importantly this is uh, this looks like hold on all right I had to pause there for a second because I want to make sure I understood this correctly um, but here this is your mole fraction in the system and ignoring these poor labelings this is the mole fraction and you can see here that as we improve or increase the flow rate of toluene we do improve the separation but we have, we have what we would call diminishing returns we don't get better and better separation uh, as we improve this or we do but it's not very impressive uh, this is a condenser duty but then the heat duty you can see that it starts to really ramp up as we increase uh, this is the reboiler duty here it really starts to take off and as we go from down here of zero phenol all the way up to say 2500 phenol we've more than uh, we've almost doubled or are approaching doubling the amount of energy input to achieve that separation so you can see there's an optimization game playing being uh, that's uh, at heart here and so now this leads us to one last thing you can see here that we can obtain this information and look at um, how this all behaves but let's say we want we're looking for a very specific result and we want a very accurate answer of everything at that result um, we can actually make aspen do the work for us in this case let's say for example we, we want to know what flow rate of phenol we need exactly to obtain a composition of methyl cyclohexane in the distillate at 98 percent if we want to achieve 98 percent purity of methyl cyclohexane in the distillate what flow rate of phenol will do that in this system well we can do that now what you'll notice here though is model analysis tools will give us the sensitivity analysis it just says how things are varying and it stores it here it has really no bearing in how we program the flow sheet the flow sheet will be these answers that we have here and all that rest of the stuff like the um, the stream tables or the uh, stream tables or not stream tables I'm sorry but the um, um, go down the profiles compositional profiles and, and all of the column and all of that is still programmed into whatever we said in the main flow sheet here it doesn't not related to the stream table at all the uh, sensitive analysis only returns to us the variables that we are asking for but let's say we want to know everything else at the same conditions that we want well we can do that by what we call doing a design spec and the design spec is under the heading of flow sheet options it's because it's actually going to change the flow sheet and all the results in the flow sheet based on this the new design spec that we're specifying here so in this case we're going to create a new design spec just like we would create a a um, sensitivity analysis and here now we're going to define a new variable that we're going to want to vary so let's call this x m c h here and so now this new variable we can call um, will be again the stream variable it would be our mole fraction of the distillate of component MCH close there you go so it has that and now we can actually specify uh, a specification we can define a specification now this specification can be simply the X MCH the variable that we just created it, that can be it or uh, we can actually have it be an equation as well uh, whatever it is so let's say we wanted to say XMCH oh, times 100 let's do in percentage basis rather than mole fraction basis so now we can specify the target at 98% so here's the specification and then a tolerance we have to specify how close is close enough for this so the tolerance we can say is 0.01 percent so we're saying that if we if you get down to 0.101%, that's good enough. You can stop. So if you are iterating and you have 97.99, uh, that's good, or 98.01, that's good. So that will be our tolerance for the uh, design spec specification. And then we're going to say what are we varying? Same thing as before. 
This is going to be a stream bar because the only thing we're going to vary is the phenol flow rate. Uh, phenol variable is about flow in power mole units. And we have to specify a range. We can't just give it infinity. We have to tell where it's going to be. Um, and looking at the previous study of our flow sheeting options, uh, or looking at the model uh, analysis, let's oh, where were we? Uh, let's go to our where is the hmm, oh model analysis tools. Going back to the sensitivity analysis here, or I guess we don't need to. We can just um, go to sensitivity analysis curve. We can see here that we are 98 somewhere around here. So we're probably going to be between, say, 1,000 and 2,000. That's That seems a reasonable range. So let's go to our input, go to our vary, and let's give it a range of 1,000 to uh, 2,000. Great. So we specified a range. It's happy because we have all that. I'm going to save just in case this goes all haywire, haywire and wooey. And now we just click run. Ah, as completed with warnings. Oh no, that's okay. Click OK. And clearly with the status check. Let's see what status says. Uh, sensitivity blocks. Oh, with warnings. That's fine. And sensitivity blocks were run in the background. We don't really care about that. What we really care about is the design spec and what came about um, from that. So if we close this. You can go to design spec results and you can see the manipulated variable, what it came to be, uh, what the XMCH calculated was 0.799 or 97.99%. It was close enough and it found a value of 1411 pound moles per hour is required to achieve this separation as we want. We can go to our streams now and you'll see here feed flow rate of phenol represents what that design spec had specified. So now all the data that's in our tables, all the data that's in the flow sheet represent what the design spec calculated as the optimum. This is the power of the design spec and why you would want to use it over just sensitivity analysis and mousing over because now we know at these optimum conditions everything else that's going on. We know the flow rates of the relative streams. We know the actual compositions of the tops and bottoms, the mole, mole fraction, the distillate mole fraction, the bottoms mole fractions. We know the density and viscosity of all these uh, uh, flow systems that we have because we did ask for the transport uh, properties. We could even go back to our blocks and look at the profiles and get the compositional profiles here. And we can actually plot out a temperature curve for this uh, profile block. And as the stages go, you can see what the temperature curve looks like and how that's going to behave. We can look at and ask for a custom plot here where it can give us uh, the stage. And we can ask for uh, the methyl and toluene compositions as a function of those stagings. And you can see how this is, how the separation is occurring. So at the top of the stage, you can see how methyl and ethyl ketone is highly enriched. And as you get to uh, stage uh, 12, I think, or if I remember correctly, was where we were feeding in. You can see this rather uh, uh, interesting uh, break in the flow. It's no longer smooth because we're flowing in a stream here, and that's where the separation is happening. You know, stage 7 is where we're flowing in phenol, and you notice that again, that strange break. It's not continuous because of that flow right here is happening. And we have the rest of the compositions behaving as you'd expect. Now this drop off here is is related to uh, the phenol composition that's happening as well. So this is in a nutshell everything you can do with design spec, everything you can do with Aspen, or just I shouldn't say everything. It's just the tip of the iceberg that you can do with it. But there's a lot of information you can be had here. You could do the same thing um, by varying the reflux ratio and see how that changes separations. You could change the um, <coughs> the sizing column. You can actually use now Aspen to calculate the size of a column and see what kind of output you'd have. What's the heat duty of these systems and how that varies with uh, reflux ratio, stage conditions, stage location, and so forth. So many things you can learn from this uh, one very simple approach. And I think with that, 
and with one very last long video, but I think this covers everything I wanted to cover for Aspen for this semester. Um, we will talk about this more in class tomorrow, and I uh, can't wait to uh, work with you. Talk to you later, and bye.